Hey there, and welcome to uh, Ask Diane number 69. Hope you're doing really, really well. We have, um, I think, three comments and I believe actually three emails. We'll see if we get through all of them. If not, it'll be later in the week. Uh, but um, but uh, yeah, with that said, let's just get started here. Uh, I want to say, uh, as usual, nothing here is a medical device, just general thoughts and comments that I help. hope will help anyone that tunes in. So with that said, let's just let's just jump in here. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I had this thing I wanted to, to share that um, I almost forgot. For anyone that is uh, listening to this or tuning into this as 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 part of uh, you know checking out the FFI slash SFI playlist, this first uh, comment, this first uh, message is the reason that this video is on that playlist. So, you know, if that's all you were interested in, then you can just check this this first, um, listen to this first uh, message from Misan, and the rest of it does not pertain to somebody that's concerned about FFI, SFI. Well, it kind of does because, you know, you know, when somebody's concerned about that, that really ultimately, in my experience, always boils down to anxiety and insomnia. So, so you may very well learn from everything here, but the, the reason this is on the playlist for SFI, SFI is this first first uh, message from Misan. And this is, uh, Misan is somebody who uh, um, he, uh, themselves had uh, a concern that they might have this. Okay, so let's read this. So this is from Misan. This is a comment on insomnia insight number 46. I've always had insomnia as far as I can remember. But four months ago, I heard for the first time about FFI and SFI in a conversation. In my innocence, I looked up on the internet about those diseases and got really scared. I started noticing some of the symptoms on my daily life. Sometimes I had no hunger at all, kept yawning all day long. Sometimes I forgot really basic things about my life and sometimes I seem to have some movement problems. When I rested on my bed at night, trying to sleep, I had small twitches on my legs or shoulders and instantly remembered the symptoms, which made me stay way longer awake, totally anxious. The worst part about this were my thoughts that kept telling me that I had the disease, that I was going to die. The anxiety made me forget that I had always had those symptoms from time to time and nothing ever happened to me. The fact that I kept hammering those feelings is what made me notice things and started to fear them. Now, four months since it all started, I still feel, I still feel sane, capable of thinking, talking and walking and able to uh, thank you for those videos. It really helped me out a lot and I hope it can help other anxious people out as well. And I'm happy to say that there are people searching for a cure for those diseases. Really hope they have success on their research. So I want to really, really thank you, Misan, for sharing uh, this. Uh, whenever somebody shares uh, a story of how they no longer are worried and how they got to that point, that is extremely, extremely helpful. Um, so I want to thank you and everybody else that has shared these these uh, these stories. And I think what I really want to point out here is what Misan says about you know at when they. Um, read up on the symptoms, then they started having them uh, themselves. And this is very, very common that you read about, let's say, forgetfulness, and then sure enough, you start forgetting things. Then you read about, uh, you know, uh, balance problems, and sure enough, then you start having balance problems. And this is just, you know, this just tells you something. It tells you that your mind is very powerful. And if it is looking for something it's worried about, then bizarrely it can like produce those symptoms to kind of reinforce the fear so that you do something about it. It basically boils down to like our brain is equipped with this very powerful like safety mechanism. And when it identifies a potential threat, it does everything it can to make sure you um, stay safe from that threat. And, and then in this case, for, for example, the brain is identified like these extremely rare uh, prion diseases as a potential threat. And as part of its attempt to keep you safe, it kind of produces the symptoms so that, you know, it, it, it makes you really convinced that you have it so you can keep safe from it, something like that. That's kind of the mechanism behind it. So, um, so you just know that if you read something and then you start noticing that, that maybe, you know, that's a sign that your mind is kind of just producing those symptoms in a kind of 
in, in, in its confused attempt at keeping you safe, you know, to put it that way. So very, very thankful, Nissan, for this. And with that said, let us um, move along to uh, our next, um, uh, let's say, comment here, which uh, is more of a question. This is a, a comment from uh, Insomnia Insight number 330 uh, from Michelle. And uh, yes, I want to say, actually, before we talk about that one, I just want to say to Michelle, thank you so, so much for reviewing my book, Set It and Forget It, on Amazon. Uh, that really, really means the world uh, to me. Uh, so I want to just thank you for that. Um, OK, so that said, let's read this comment from uh, Michelle. This is a great video. And by the way, this video was about how uh, it, it can appear that your, your sleepiness just vanishes, that it just disappears. And um, I've started to work on this. Um, um, I don't know what it's going to become, maybe a book or uh, a white paper or something where I describe these common phenomena and kind of give them words. And I think that can be really helpful in terms of like demystifying them. And uh, I th this one, by the way, that I'm talking about in Insomnia Insight number 33, I decided to call the, the Houdini effect or maybe a Houdini moment. Because again, like Houdini seems like you, you know, he was like trapped down there, but then he oh, managed to escape. So this, I, I'm start starting to call this when sleepiness vanishes, the Houdini effect. All right, let's read this. This is a great video, it's right up my alley. Even if my sleep has gotten better, I still have a few not so good nights a week. It's mainly because of hyper arousal. Sometimes I'd go to bed and be wide awake. Then I either have adrenaline jolts or hypnic jerks. These are the ones that end up keeping me up almost all night sometimes. For some reason, even if I know I can sleep, my mind still wants to monitor whenever I'm falling asleep. It's so strange. The worst part is that then I start panicking about having my brain relate my bed with wakefulness. So I start practicing stimulus control. And if I end up falling asleep, I wake up to verify I'm in bed, if whether I'm in bed or on the couch. Sometimes through the day, I try to experience the same emotions so I can accept them when they come at night. But sometimes they become worse and happen even more throughout the day and night. Have you ever heard of something like this happening? I know it's a process, but wow, it can be a rough road sometimes, especially for us overthinkers and anxious people. Yeah, I, I've heard of, I, I can't, maybe not like exactly this wording, but the same, the same, uh, how should you call it, phenomenon or something. It's, it's something of a the sleep effort thing where. Actually, today we had some really good questions from um, from Chen. Is it? I think Chen. Um, similar to this one, meaning what is what is very important to understand is that anything can become a sleep effort. And a sleep effort, for those of you who are new to the channel, sleep effort is something you do to try to protect your sleep or preserve your sleep or, or make 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 you have more sleep. A classic sleep effort is like keeping the bedroom pitch dark, you know. Uh, if you do that, by the way, because let's say somebody has no trouble sleeping at all, but they're kind of annoyed by light in the morning and they decide to keep their, you know, put in some blackout curtains, there's absolutely no problem with that. But when you do it in an attempt to like, you don't understand what's going on, I got to really make sure I get more sleep. I'm going to put in these blackout curtains to make it pitch black. That's the sleep effort. You're trying to do something to produce sleep. And the reason these sleep efforts always uh, backfire is because they feed into the reason you have trouble sleeping, which is the desire to sleep. Uh, you know, um, briefly here, uh, when you have start having trouble sleeping for whatever reason it is, uh, if you don't kind of react to it, then the, it will be self-resolved. But if your desire, if your trouble sleeping leads to you having more desire to sleep, you're wondering what's happening, you're trying to sleep, you're begging for it, hoping for it, researching, it, trying, etc. Then that desire to sleep creates more trouble sleeping, and the trouble sleeping creates an even stronger desire for sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you do these sleep efforts, you're trying to sleep, you're reinforcing that desire, you're increasing the desire for sleep, which creates more trouble. And so that's the problem with sleep efforts. And, and so where I was going with here was to say that anything, bizarrely, anything can become a sleep effort. For example, um, if you are starting a CBTI course and you're like, I, I really want this to work. I want this to make me sleep. And you constantly, as you're learning, like, I hope this will make me sleep. I think this will make me sleep. I hope, I hope. Then you've created that, you've created a sleep effort out of that course and it makes things worse. 
and in, in you know what I read here is that you know um, Michelle is kind of like trying to produce the emotions uh, during the day so she can accept them when they come at night but that can actually make them worse and that's all to do with this like if you're doing anything with the kind of hope that you will that thing will make you sleep more at night it always backfires and I and it, it's kind of complex here because I completely understand the thought behind it but um it, it, anything can become an effort and I think when when it's kind of backfires like this that's that it did be, it's it must have become an effort uh, and so I, I've heard of very similar things like some people ask me like uh, I, I'm trying to let go but that makes it worse then you know then you weren't actually letting go like the letting go process became an effort and and it, it's 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 hard to explain but anything can be a sleep effort let me give you this example which is a good one i think a sleep effort again we talked about that and you should you know the general good thing to do is to avoid sleep efforts but even that even trying not to have sleep efforts like going like oh my god i'm gonna i have to eliminate every single sleep effort i do that can also become a sleep effort. This is kind of the really tricky thing with sleep. So, the, but, but what can reverse the whole thing is that you just actually, you don't need that much to reverse the whole thing. You just need a few magical moments, a few moments where you see that, oh, I did less and I slept more. I would let go and sleep came to me. When you, when you start having those, then you really start getting, it really starts to click and you start really letting go and sleeping better. Now, I, I wanted to comment on this like, uh, um, even if my sleep has gotten better, I still have a few not so good nights a week. It's mainly because of hyper arousal. This sentence is so important um, because there's insight. Like there's no mystery to why you sometimes have a few not so good nights a week. And that's that's that puts you, Michelle, in a completely different position than somebody who's like, I don't understand what's going on. I'm completely mystified. I'm panicking. I'm desperate. You know, just knowing what's going on is a huge, huge help, you know. Um, and it may, it may seem like, well, I'm not sleeping, still not sleeping so great, even if I understand what's going on. Well, guess what? If you just have that understanding, that foundation, sleep will start coming to you. Sleep will start coming to you. Education, understanding is the foundation. And, um, and your sleep has gotten better. That's fantastic. That's really good. And um, I, I don't really read this through in this email, but oftentimes I get an email which is basically saying, I'm getting better but how do I take the next step? You know, I, I now want to improve uh, things more. And then the the key insight there is that, well, you're doing better because you kind of try less. So to get even better, you have to try even less. You know, that that becomes the key to that one. Uh, and yeah, I think that's I think that was important things. I think um, for some reason, okay, my mind social. Sure. My mind starts to monitor whenever I'm falling asleep. It's so strange, yeah. That the hypnic awareness we call that one when you're you just about to fall asleep, and then your mind for, for you know takes takes a note of that. Nothing strange, very common. So yeah, I think um, uh, I guess one more thing I want to ask here. I think I think you're working with a coach. I think you're working with Martin actually, Michelle. So I think it's always good to have this one person that guides you through. Uh, but so talk to Martin about this. But my take on Stimulus control is that I think it's as long as wakefulness is your friend, it doesn't, I don't think it's so important whether you're in your bed or in or, or elsewhere. So I think a lot of people, you know, wake up and then immediately go like, I got to leave the bed because I'm awake. I don't think that necessarily is helpful. I think if you stay in bed and do something enjoyable, whether it's just like thinking about something pleasant, taking that mental journey or reading a book or drawing or whatever like I think that is just fine as well as long as you make wakefulness your friend you're doing great because remember that um, threat monitoring we talked about before like how your brain can think that wakefulness is a threat uh, when when you when wakefulness becomes a friend and not a threat that is hugely important in terms of like not having any trouble sleeping again okay so we will um, uh, stop there with that one, Michelle. With, let me know, Michelle, uh, if you have any more questions. And thanks again for that review. Really, really appreciate it. Okay. So now we have another comment on the same video from Haval, the chain Derek. I'm going to say, let's say Derek in this video. Hello, Daniel. I've commented several times before. Yes, I, I, I never remember that. I, I suffer again from trouble sleeping. It always lurked around here and there when I did night shifts, but I always managed to sleep. 
this time I have terrible anxiety, get so much weird with how I sleep now and how my sleep is not restful and it's getting interrupted so many times. So here it goes. It started again at the beginning of this month. I was stressed about my practical exams, but had to do this one night shift. This one night shift, then my sleep went into havoc. After the shift, I slept good, but woke up late evening. I stayed awake to the next day with only two hours of sleep, woke up then to go to college, was so tired, came back at home at 5 p.m., ate something, slept 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., woke up, slept again to 1 a.m., then woke up and slept uh, to 5 a.m. I know this is getting boring. <laughs> I know it's getting boring. It's a parenthesis here. It was good. And I got a grip on it afterwards again. However, since a week ago and out of the blue, when I sleep, my mind keeps waking up every one hour and I get frustrated and think to myself, I'm thinking now and know that I'm awake. It has been this way uh, since a week and my night shift two days ago certainly did not help. I, I must work tomorrow again. And I'm still not asleep. It makes me so anxious. My mind wakes up when I sleep. It happens four or five times every time I sleep. Only time I know I sleep is when I see dreams. But I feel tired now after a week of this and I have brain fog with huge, huge anxiety that this happens. I think about it as if I as usual, but can you tell me why this happened just suddenly? Why is my sleep interrupted and not comfy? Why are my thoughts getting weird when I try to sleep? Sorry for the long post, but really need help. Absolutely, Derek, I'm happy you um, uh, share this. And um, let's go over just a couple of things in this email and then talk about like the big picture and, and why this happens. Um, I noticed, um, one thing that triggered kind of my spidey senses, which is, you know, a lot of people have hear me say this a lot, but, um, here's, here we go in the beginning when I did night shifts, I always managed to sleep. It's very, this is very, very common to hear someone say, um, eh, you know, in the past I was able to sleep at least this much or in the past I always managed to sleep. Whenever I hear those, that type of wording, like manage, I was successful. I was able, um, you know, that tells a story of somebody who has started to think that they've lost control. It's the story of somebody who's, who thinks, in the past, I had the ability, I was able to, I managed to, I could sleep, but now I can't. In reality, it is, that that's not that's not what's happening. In reality, it, it, sleep happens when we're not trying. You know, if you just ask somebody to sleep super well, how they do that, they have no clue. And that's 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 because if you're not trying, not wanting, not hoping, not thinking about sleep, it comes very easy to you. But when when it can seem it can be confusing, it can seem like when you're not sleeping where where you did in the past, you lost that ability or that skill. But that's not the case. In fact, you have a lot to learn from how you slept in the past, and and that is when you're not trying then it comes to you. So uh, I just want to point that one out. Whenever you think of sleep as like something active, like I have to do something to sleep, I have to try to do it, I have to manage to sleep, then um, you're uh, you're going to have more trouble sleeping. So I uh, just point, want to point that one out. And then this part where you said maybe it's getting boring, the, I think the, the most important part there is that there was so much attention. You know, you knew what time you fell asleep, what time you woke up, what time you fell back asleep, et cetera. And that's on the same note there, that has to do with control, that when you start having trouble sleeping, it seems like you had control over something in the past, and now you no longer have control over it. So in an attempt to kind of gain control, you you keep track of what time you fell asleep, how much you slept, how many times you woke up, what time you woke up, et cetera. Some people use trackers, and that seems like a very reasonable thing to do, but in fact, it is the desire for control that is producing the lack of control, or at least the lack of, there is never control, so I should say, put it this way, it's the desire for control that leads to um, chaos, you know, unpredictability, you know, not being able to foresee or, or know what's gonna happen. So it's only when you um, cede control, when you no longer try to take control that you start actually sleeping in a more predictable fashion again. So that's second thing I wanted to point out. So I think it's always good to like try not to know what time it is or what time you slept or et cetera. Like that. not knowing, going timeless is very important. Um, so we talked about that. And uh, I think those were the two things, um, uh, th those kind of two more specific things. And now the big picture thing here, like so 
Um, Derek had been doing okay, but uh, the sleep, trouble sleeping has been lurking around and now kind of like, it seems like out of the blue, um, it just started happening. Uh, and and here here is my th thoughts on why why that is. So um, if we think about this kind of model I described before, which is anything can cause you to have trouble sleeping, and that can then lead you to have this kind of a desire for sleep, and that can produce more trouble sleeping, and then you can have this circular problem. It just goes on and on. Well, if we think that in that, let, let's just for um, uh, for educational purposes here, imagine that we have numbers here that somebody who sleeps really, really well has like a zero trouble sleeping and zero desire for sleep. It's just like nothing going on, right? Now, when you start having trouble sleeping, that trouble score can go up to, let's say, a two, but if you don't react to it, it goes back down to zero and you actually have, you sleep well again. But if your trouble sleeping score of two triggers the desire score of two, then now that desire score, the desire can trigger a high, more trouble sleeping, so that goes up to a three, let's say, and then you have a stronger desire for sleep that goes up to a three as well, and then you have this kind of escalating situation because the whole thing just worse and worse. And then what can happen is for some reason, uh, we don't know why, uh, but for some reason, Derek, um, did like his desire for sleep was decreased. Uh, maybe it was distraction, maybe education, maybe something like that. So. Uh, Derek was no longer thinking as much about sleep. The desire went down, trouble sleeping went down. But, and here's my point, that desire score, if you will, never went down to a complete zero. It stayed at a, let's say, 0 0.25 or whatever. It was lurking there. There was always a little bit of like, when, when I call desire again, it's that like want, puzzlement, wanting to sleep, needing sleep, like being a little bit worried about sleep. Like it was that sense that, I have some problem sleeping. So the desire for sleep was not a zero. It was not a complete like, uh, I know I can sleep. I'm not worried about sleep at all. I understand it completely. And that and that that desire can be kind of like reignited by a lot of things, you know? It's kind of like PTSD, if you will, that if you ever had something happen to you that was traumatic, then a lot of things can kind of trigger those emotions again. So let's say it was a night, let's say it was just a night shift uh, and some stress related to that that triggered that desire again, like you were again, like thinking, what's wrong? Why can't I sleep? It could be like a very subconscious thing, but then that thinking about sleep triggered more trouble sleeping. And then you start having this like circular problem again when the whole thing goes on again. And, and the key insight is that when you have these two things going on, you have trouble sleeping and you have a stronger desire for sleep. It seems like the, the solution is like, I got to, have no trouble sleeping so that I don't worry about sleep anymore, but it's actually the opposite. You have to kind of educate yourself and reduce your desire for sleep so that you then have less trouble sleeping. You have to start in that end. So I always think like learning education, um, demystification, et cetera, is, is always what uh, is the key. But again, the reason that you can have trouble sleeping again after some time out of the blue is that you never really, really um, abandoned this thinking that I have trouble sleeping, I need sleep, etc. cetera. Um, I hope that made sense, um, uh, Derek. And uh, and basically, what should you do? I think, again, understanding is the key. I hope this video was was helpful to you. And, um, and other than that, I think that, you know, we've already talked about, like, um, not letting go of uh, like letting go of time start, you know, try not to track sleep is very important and um not thinking about sleep as a skill is very important and so yeah i hope this helped Eric. And if I follow questions like please let me know and i'll be more than happy to answer that of course and with that said let's move on here to an email from sam um hi daniel i'm glad that i discovered your youtube channel i'm glad you discovered it as well well, my first experience of insomnia was uh, in April because of a health scare at first. I was worrying about not sleeping, but now I'm scared of sleep, yet I want to sleep. I know it seems weird and contradicted, but I don't know why the transition from wakefulness to sleep bothers me whenever I think about it. I suffer from a great anxiety when I close my eyes. The first thing that comes to my mind is how will I lose consciousness and fall asleep? which makes me anxious and ex exacerbates my insomnia and I hope um, will help me overcome this irrational fear. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Sam, for sending me this. And I want to say right off the bat here that um, 
two things actually there's a playlist that's going to be in the description in this to this episode and it's in the description of all recent videos uh with a link to uh, yeah again a link to a playlist on like hypnic jerks and hypnic awareness which we've come to call that this in our channel hypnic awareness is when you're about to fall asleep and you suddenly become aware of it and um the story here is a very common one that there was a health scare triggered some worry about uh, not sleeping uh and 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 although like it seems like what's happening now is kind of opposite to that i think they're very much related meaning when you start having trouble sleeping you start paying attention to your sleep and one thing you can start actually noticing is uh the the moment when you're you're drifting away to sleep and when you pay, pay attention and we and when you notice that moment it can be very frightening it's very similar to hypnic jerks where you're like th those actually happen all the time we all have these kind of like little jerks when we're about to fall asleep that transitioning into sleep but same thing there we can when we start paying attention we can notice them and they can become very we can be very scared of them and the more scared we are the more we notice them etc 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 and so uh, i think uh um if, if you check that playlist out i think in that playlist you will have talking insomnia number 16 when i talk to alex there's a lot of comments on that. In the comments section, there's a lot of great material. But uh, Alex said something very, very similar to what you described going on there. So I think you can learn a lot there. But um, I think th I think the, the main two things here I want to say is that what you describe is not uncommon at all. It's very common. And number two, um, be becoming aware of falling asleep happens a lot. But most of us, it happens to me every now and then. But um, as I don't really reflect much upon it, I mostly just forget it and fall asleep. But again, when you start paying attention, it can be really frightening and it can happen over and over and over again. So if you just um, um, try to resist the urge to figure it out, you know, try to not go in the direction of thinking like, oh, could it be this? Could it be that? And try not to experiment, try not to be like, uh, prevented from happening try not to go in the direction of like oh, i'm gonna do this so it doesn't happen but the opposite going in the direction of oh this is actually normal nothing strange and if it happens well guess what that's just a welcome sign that i'm about to fall asleep if you go in that direction uh you will not notice it anymore and it won't bother you so hope that helped sam and thanks so much for this um question with that said, let's move in to another email here from uh, uh, Beanie. Hi, Daniel. Uh, I would really like you to answer a question that I have. I've watched dozens of your videos from YouTube where you already answered a lot of questions that I had, but I don't think this question is addressed directly. I'm not entirely sure. Correct me if I am wrong. My question basically boils down to should I do sleep restriction if I have adrenal fatigue slash burnout? I'm not entirely sure whether adrenal fatigue slash burn would describe my symptoms. I've watched several videos and I've read about the subject and it seems to fit my condition more or less. In a nutshell, I have chronic stress-related symptoms which fire up in response to stimulation or excessive physical mental effort. Examples of these stomach intense tension and pain, aka IBS, chronic diarrhea, muscle tensions all over the body, most notably in my chest and neck, trouble breathing, feeling of my skin burning, etc. When it comes to my sleep, I have both sleep onset and maintenance insomnia during the night, but during the day, weirdly enough, I have less trouble falling asleep. In order to address my insomnia, I've tried a number of techniques, all unsuccessful in the long run. I've tried doing sleep restriction for over a year or more, but with little results, maybe because I'm not doing it correctly. I regularly feel so worn out when my time, uh, my sleep window is over that I need to take a nap to be able to function. As a sleep physician, I... Uh, visited a few months back told me that my sleep pattern was so fragmented that it would not benefit from sleep restriction at this stage first i would uh, need to reduce the anxiety slash hyperarousal what do you think related to my main question i wonder if patterns of mental illness affect sleep i think i sometimes have patterns that fall into the ocd and adhd categories but i'm not completely sure at times i can get distracted quite easily and have repetitive thoughts wandering through my head I've been trying to not think of sleep as much as possible, especially before going to bed. Instead, I mostly try to relax, but still I haven't been able to consistently go to bed and sleep. Thank you in advance for taking the time to read this email for any suggestions, even if it's general advice, I'm extremely grateful. And then I think there are kind of two additional ones that we'll uh, talk about in a second. 
All right, so thanks so much, Vini, for asking me. And um, I want to say a couple of things. Um, firstly, actually, start here. I think we talked, oh, we already talked about this. Uh, sleep, anything can become a sleep effort. So for when I hear uh, something uh, like this described, like I tried like sleep restriction, which is commonly used in CBTI for over a year, it didn't work. I think of it, 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 it's probably become a sleep effort. It's probably that you were, you were doing that to try to make yourself sleep more. And whenever we try to make ourselves sleep, it always backfires. And that's number one. Number two is a sleep restriction. I, I've, I've um, really um, I really come to think of as very differently as, uh, as opposed to what I thought in the beginning, uh, a couple of like two years ago. I, I think... Um, in CBTI, there's a problem, and that problem is that sleep restriction is presented as a way to kind of make sure you're really sleepy when you go to bed so that you can sleep at night. And that, as you can hear by the description, it really lends itself to become a sleep effort. You're like, I got to keep myself up. I got to keep myself up so I get some sleep. And then when you finally hit like, you know, 1138, then you're like, now I can sleep. But then, then there's so much pressure that you can't sleep. So I think it is good for most people to spend a little bit less time in bed. You know, if somebody's spending like nine hours in bed, maybe, you know, seven and a half is better, maybe seven, something like that. But not to force sleep, but just to take a psychological step away from the act of trying to sleep. Because that's really at the bottom of everything. The more you try, the less you get. That is it. So um, that, those are some thoughts on maybe why it wasn't helpful in the past. And then um, I, I was I want to comment on this. I, I don't I don't know much about adrenal fatigue either, um, but um, you know I know I know you read about a lot about it. But uh, but I want to say I'm definitely not a, an expert. But these things that I hear like uh, intense intense uh, tension in the stomach, uh, muscle tensions, uh, trouble breathing, feeling my skin burn, etc. Uh, when I hear those, and again, uh, this is not a medical device, it's just you know, me sharing general thoughts. When I hear these, I'm thinking hyperarousal, you know, hyperarousal can cause all kinds of things. Well, actually what it does is it, it makes us like pay more attention to things going on. So somebody that's hyperaroused often describes like burning, twitching, like uh, tinnitus, maybe visual disturbances, um, um, memory problems, memory fog, um, you know, all, all kinds of things. So hyper arousal could explain a lot of things um, when it comes to sleep, both. Uh, oh, yeah, this one I want to comment on. But during the day, weird enough, I have less trouble falling asleep. I, actually, that's that's common. Uh, that's very common. And um, and I think that is a good illustration of like when you're not trying to sleep, it comes easy. So daytime, you're probably less pressure to sleep. You don't feel that uh, that you really need to sleep as much during the day. You would rather sleep at night. So when you're not wanting to sleep as, as much, and then it comes easier. That's very common. Um, and we talked about the sleep restriction already. And, um, and okay, this question, uh, would sleep restriction not benefit me? I, I should first need to reduce the anxiety hyperarousal. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, meaning, um, if somebody has a completely like erratic sleep schedule, like somebody sleeps from like, one day like 9 p.m. to like 1 uh you know 1 a.m. and then from you know 10 a.m. to you know 2 p.m. and then like 6 p.m. to like something like that then uh i think it is good to try to get some regularity and the way you do that is to have a pretty regular wake up time and um and then not you know and again have a pretty regular wake up time and not sleep more than you know, um, during, let's say, the day, uh, for simplicity, let's say, you know, we need to regularize this. Let's say you try to get up at seven and don't go to bed before midnight or something like that. Well, guess what? Then you're kind of already having a sleep window. So I see really no reason not to do both. But what I think, um, where I think some people may have a different opinion is if they, if they practice like kind of traditional CBTI where they have this like strict short sleep window, then it may make more sense to like just say, okay, let's have you get up at the same time every morning, get things more regular, and then we can work on other things. But uh, the way I would approach it would be to say, well, it's kind of the same thing anyway. Like regularizing your sleep schedule 
and doing a sleep window is like, why not do both at the same time? Because you're, I don't believe in that strict sleep window, tight sleep window anyway. And, and the other question is like, should I first reduce the anxiety slash hyperarousal? And that's another thing where like, if you think about it from a, from a traditional CBTI perspective, then it may make sense to say, well, we, we should not do this, uh, sleep restriction thing. We should like work on, um, your hyper arousal first. But the way I look at it is that, uh, having a sleep window, which is not extreme in any way, which is a, a very, uh, you know, a gentle sleep window, call it that is a very good way of reducing anxiety and hyper arousal. Um, because when you, when you, it, it's it, the, the whole reason to have that sleep window again is like to try less and trying less is a great way of uh, being less anxious because you're trying less and then you sleep better. So I think, I think both are really the same thing. And by the way, how do you reduce anxiety and hyperarousal? In my mind is education. When you are, when something is confusing, you don't understand it, it's mysterious, it's weird, it's odd, it's bizarre, it's strange, it's unusual. That lends to anxiety and hyperarousal. When you, when you get to a point where you're like, oh, uh, nothing really strange is going on here. I, I have insomnia like everybody else there's nothing really unusual about my insomnia that's really when you make great progress and you and you like hyperarousal goes down anxiety goes down so those are some thoughts there i wonder if uh patterns of mental illness affect sleep um like ocd adhd i want to say that um i think this fits very well into um well into two things like first of all you can think of things that are circumstances um that, um, for example, people bring up a lot like uh, their diet or health conditions or medications they're taking or bedroom, the bedroom environment, things like that, and ask like, do you think this affects my sleep? And uh, a, a lot of things affect your sleep, but you can't do anything about them. So then there are circumstances, then why even try to, you know, you, you can't do anything about it. So like th thinking about them itself is not really helpful which actually, I, I, I thought I was gonna say two things, but it kind of becomes the same thing here. So another way of thinking of it is like, um, think of this formula and you can plug all kinds of things in it. X is not the problem, thinking about X is. So for example, uh, I have a OCD tendencies. Uh, could that um, be the reason I have trouble sleeping? Well, sure, like um, having a tendency to kind of like be a perfectionist or kind of like control, that often it lends itself to having trouble sleeping. But let's say you've always had this, you know, that's probably nothing you, 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 that you can do immediately about this. So think of it as a circumstance as like uh, OCD is not the problem. Thinking about OCD is the problem, meaning if you accept that, yes, I have some OCD tendencies, uh, but me thinking about that, me wondering if that plays a role, me thinking, feeling hopeless because I have OCD, me being frustrated because I have OCD, et cetera, that is the real problem not the OCD itself. So you can use that X is not the problem, thinking about X is to plug in all kinds of things like caffeine, you know, um, side effects of medications, uh, dietary things, you know, uh, activities at night, you know, all kinds of things fits in that, that, that model. Um, and then we talked about that. Um, and it, okay, I want to just point out this one instead at bed. Uh, I have been trying to not think of sleep. Uh, instead, I mostly try to relax. The, the, here, you you kind of run into the pink elephant problem, where like, if I tell you like, don't think about a pink elephant, then you think about a pink elephant, right? So when you try not to think of sleep, you <laughs> end up thinking about sleep. And th same thing with this. I I, I try to relax. It rela by definition, being relaxed is like a completely passive process. And when you're trying to be relaxed, just like a sleep effort, the more you try to relax, the more tense you become. So um, I th so what should you be doing then? I think it's like acceptance is really, really key here, willingness to experience things. So being willing to have trouble sleeping, you know, saying that if I have trouble sleeping tonight, that's okay. Uh, I, I, I'm willing to have that. Like it's, it seems kind of crazy when I say that the first time, but if you, if you can get to a point where you are willing to experience it, then uh, you, you stop thinking so much about it because it's really like you've kind of diffused it. You, you kind of neutralized the threat there. Same thing with the relaxation. Like if you're like, I'm willing to be a little bit anxious, I'm willing to experience anxiety, then it's not so much a threat anymore that comes easy to you. That is a good one. And the other one is just that if you're in the position where you can do this, 
just enjoyment, pleasure, like doing things you enjoy, that is a, also can work really, really well. Um, so we talked about that. So yeah, I think that was it for those ones. We and uh, and then there were two additional questions. I have two more questions that I wanted to ask. They are kind of related to my insomnia. Number one, how much can excessive uh, frequent masturbation affect sleep drive duration, etc.? I've read from multiple sources that hormone secretion made by the gonads can affect interfere the serotonin and melatonin levels. This is accurate. It, this is a perfect one to uh, plug into that model. X is not the problem. Thinking about X is the problem. Uh, so that was that one. And then number two, how much can energy or lack of it affect my sleep? Should I try to exhaust myself on a daily basis, relax as much as possible, or find a place in between? In fact, this is the same thing again. Uh, but to just um, spend a little more time on this one is um, <clears throat> exercising for pleasure because you enjoy it is fantastic. If it has absolutely no... Uh, if you don't think at all about how that's going to impact sleep in either direction, just enjoy it, do it, you know, make yourself feel good. That's perfect. Uh, but if you are exercising in an attempt at kind of making yourself more tired, making yourself sleepy, then it becomes a sleep effort. You're trying to sleep and then you're going to sleep less. So I would say just um, in, in do it for enjoyment, but don't think at all about sleep. Uh, you know, uh, that is important. So, yeah. I think that was it. Um, if you have any any follow-up questions, uh, Vinny, just please let me know. And with that said, we will go on to our next one. I think this is the yeah, I think this is the last last question for today. Let's read this. This is from Gavin. Hi. Have trouble sleeping during nights or mornings. I get tired sometimes, and sometimes I don't even after one to two days. I'm pretty sure I have insomnia, which I had last year. And I beat it last year. I slept eight hours in 10 days. I got me scared, but I didn't know what FFI or SFI was last year. I know they are extremely rare, but part of me is saying I can have it, although I don't think my parents have FFI or SFI, although they're nearly 50 and might not show symptoms yet. I think that my grandparents don't have FFI. They're likely 70 plus, so they can't genetically transfer it down. Then what worries me is SFI. I can sleep, but I have unstoppable dreams. And I sleep for a few hours, then wake up and sleep and wake up every hour by then. I really messed up my schedule. Like yesterday, I slept from 12 p.m. afternoon, woke up 5 p.m., went back to sleep. I'm not sure, but I started to dream. Woke up 6 p.m., went back to sleep. Woke up 7 p.m., went back to sleep. Woke up 8 p.m., back to sleep. Woke up 9 p.m., and I just got up. I do get tired and can't sleep. Sometimes I'm just scared because I show majority of the symptoms, such as insomnia, muscle jerks, like sometimes my legs just move a bit. When I'm trying to sleep, loss of appetite, dementia. I usually forgot things easily. Anyway, I don't know if these symptoms are caused by my anxiety uh, or of it a uh, year, but my anxiety got triggered hard, but I didn't know what FFI or SFI was. School eventually fixed it for me, but this year I can barely get sleep because of my fear of me having it. I can sleep sometimes. I'm only a teen and it is triggering my anxiety thinking about it. I always, I was always a kid who thought of death where I either I feel pain I think it's some disease such as cancer when I had really bad headaches with so much I thought it was a brain tumor, but eventually stopped. Also, sometimes when I try and sleep, my mind starts to think about random things and I can imagine them visually like it's complete random, but I'm awake. I can just open my eyes like, like a dream, but just the visual part, uh, but way different than the dreams I'm experiencing now. I know dreams could be caused by anxiety. I have a major majority of FI, SFI symptoms, but they could all be caused by my anxiety. What do you think? You know, I think... Um, um, I think actually, uh, if you go back to like the first uh, comment here from Misan, what we learned there was, uh, that Misan describes the same thing that Misan, I think, I think, I think it's Misan is he, I, I don't know, but I'll say here, I think Misan, um, thought he had, uh, FFI or SFI and, but realized that it was really the anxiety that produced the symptoms. So I think that is hugely important to know that just reading about things can make your brain produce those exact things. And uh, I want to say that overall, like, uh, you know, nothing is medical advice if, you know, talk to your parents, your doctor, et cetera. But this type of like very in and out of sleep thing, like where you wake up every hour and you, you don't feel like you slept at all, you have vivid dreams, et cetera, is very common with anxiety. And uh, I think that let's just read this last thing. There was kind of a second email came in here. Um, when I close my eyes, my mind starts thinking of random things like normal things, but still can't fall asleep. Also feels so weird even to sleep 5 p.m. because I did an all-nighter 
I uh, woke up seven. I asked my sister if I slept. She said yes. Then closed my eyes, and all of a sudden it's nine. I don't feel like I feel like it felt like time traveled. This is very common, uh, you know, that we call it paradoxical insomnia, where you think you're awake but you didn't realize that you were asleep. And this is because of hyper arousal that you're in this kind of heightened level of alertness, kind of like anxiety, and and you're you don't even register sleeping. You know, you just like time just fast forwards. A lot of people describe how they're watching a movie and then just like skips ahead or something like that. So um, I, I think that, uh, you know, as always, when anybody's concerned about their health, talk to your doctor. But again, what we read here is very common um, and uh, nothing unusual, nothing that we haven't heard a lot of times on the channel. So I, I hope this helped, uh, Gavin. Um, and, and please check out the playlist, FFI, SFI playlist. I think you'll find a lot of help there. And uh, yeah, with that said, we will conclude uh, this episode. And if anyone has a question, then please send it to questions at the .com or send uh, or leave a comment. And I uh, look forward to having you back here real soon. Until then, take it easy.